Well, good, good morning, everyone. And thank you for joining us again for our coffee and conversation. Uh, this is our 187th. Uh, amazing how many we've had. They've all been quite marvelous. Uh, I would like to comment again. Uh, we need to thank the generous support we get from all of you, but also the city, uh, for everything they do for us in this building. And again, we're responsible for the collection programs, anything we do. But we're so fortunate that the city provides us the heating, lighting, all this kind of stuff, the building. Uh, so anyway, so we always need to recognize them for the, all of that help. Uh, let's see. We are surviving very much for the collections and our coffee and donuts on a donation. So please, at any time, you feel very generous. And also, if you've uh, received in the mail one of our little membership flyers and all that stuff, uh, please rejoin. Uh, we'd love to have you as a formal member as part of our museum. Uh, this is a good time to turn off or silence your cell phones. Uh, I'm guilty party at that too, I better do it. Yeah, I'm very good. Okay, I'm safe. Uh, and let's see, just as another reminder, uh, please sign our attendance sheets uh, upstairs or uh, just as you came in because we do need to document that people actually visit with us. Uh, I'd like to highlight a new special art exhibit we have upstairs. If you haven't seen it, it's in the hallway. It's part of a program we call Art Hillary. Uh, and it's a rotating exhibit series uh, that we kind of sponsor featuring artwork from local U.S. military service members or local artists with a military interest. And this is the second one we've had. And this is entitled Sister Soldier Scene. And it's really quite marvelous. And it was done by two sisters, Mariana Brunkhorst and Melody Huishjen. Hush, I always pronounce it. Uh, and it's a collaborative display by both of them of both poetry and visual arts. Mariana was an Air Force veteran. Uh, and she's expertise and always played with words and poetry. And Melody creates in the visual media. So they kind of combine together to kind of tell Mariana's story of service. So please go upstairs and just visit that afterwards. I'd like to highlight uh, our, two, our next two uh, coffee and conversations. On 14 March, Christy Barker is going to join us, and she's a public affairs person from the VA hospital in Denver. And she's going to give an overview of the new hospital, its services, answer any kind of questions you have, highlight clinics that are connected with it. So I think it's well worth, you know, if you have any connections or needing to go down there, uh, come, you know, visit and ask questions and so on with uh, Christy. That's the 14th of March. And then the 28th of March, Michael Proctor is going to be our speaker. Another one of these Navy guys. We've just, just everywhere you turn, we've got Navy guys. Go Navy! Go Navy! <laughs> anyway, but this, this is interesting. Most of you Navy guys lately have been flyers or, you know, surface ships. Well, Michael uh, served on the USS Cincinnati, which is a nuclear attack submarine. Uh, so this is a different world uh, for all of us, or at least certainly for me. Uh, so it would be quite interesting to hear his stories. He was a machinist first mate, he, essentially an E6 for us Army guys. Uh, but anyway, he'll be joining us the 28th of March. So I uh, certainly hope you'll be able to join us for that. Uh, so without kind of further ado, I'd like to introduce Elena. In fact, we met each other here one evening during a kind of a workshop Tara uh, was uh, giving. Mm -hmm. And it was an interesting workshop, but I think we were the one, I think there were three of us. 
in this whole workshop. And we had to act out our feelings. Oh, so. oh that was, uh, yeah. yeah, I had problems with that. But anyway, it, it was, yeah, yeah. but anyway, uh, thank you so much for joining us. And there you go. I'm going to turn the light down a little bit here so we can see Great. the screen better. Cool. Um, so yeah, I'm Elena Blorier. Uh, and I was a 68 whiskey in the U.S. Army Reserves. Uh, 68 is medical identifier, and whiskey means that I was a combat medic. Um, so my story kind of starts with my mom. Uh, she is that lady right there. Um, and she was a E-8 Master Sergeant, served 24 years in the Army, um, and she was a 68 Whiskey Mike 6, so same job as me, but she also had the nursing component added on. Um, and then she served as a uh, NCO instructor for the remainder of her career after she was a nurse. So she saw, taught at the NCO Academy to train other leaders. So my mom was in for so long that I... Uh, kind of became 18 and didn't know how to pay for college and my mom had been gunning for me to join the army her whole life so I kind of found myself in a recruiter's office um, and at 18 years old I went to basic training in 2012 at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Um, this is what the barracks look like now at Fort Sill. They call them starships and this is one wing, and it looks like a X, and every single uh, side of it has a different um, company. So there would be four companies training basic training cycles in one building, and they have a bunch of those at Fort Sill now. Um, 2012 was unique because it was the repeal of Don't Ask, Don't Tell. So I was the very first cycle uh, at Fort Sill um, where you were allowed to identify as any sort of LGBT alignment in the military and you weren't, um, there were no punitive actions for that. Um, we had fully integrated barracks of male and female, so there were, every single floor was male, male, female, um, and we all trained together. Uh, there, in 2012, there was a new sexual assault initiative. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of this, but the numbers were extremely high as reporting for sexual assault. So they have the buddy system, which means that anywhere I went, I either had to have a female with me or two males. Um, I was not allowed to have a buddy male, female, and you were never allowed to be alone in basic training. Uh, even when you went to the bathroom, you had to have a buddy with you to make sure that uh, you were not being assaulted. So it was kind of an intense initiative. Um, so that was kind of unique about 2012 where they're pushing through this initiative to try and lower their assault rates. I'm Yes, it's not as intensive because they realized the two males to one female buddy system was not actually doing anything different than, so um, they've kind of cut back in the intensity, but the buddy system is still existing and the assault rates have gone down. So um, that's good news. Uh, this is what they make you wear for the first uh, probably about four weeks of basic training, you're not allowed to be called your name. You're only a jersey number and you earn your name. So I liked this picture because this is the exact jersey that I wore. I was a red number three, so they called me red three for the first four to five weeks. And then I finally earned Private Blorier. Uh, this is me, that's uh, 18 year old me, right after I got promoted to E2. Uh, in basic training. So after Fort Sill, Oklahoma, I graduated and went to my advanced individual training. Uh, this was at San Antonio, Texas at Fort Sam Houston. Um, this is kind of what, this is not my picture, but this is what a typical uh, training day would look like. You're always outside. Um, you're giving people practice IVs and um, you're going through all of the medical care. You're always wearing your full battle rattle, so we have the plates and everything that have to be on at all times during training. 
and you have all of the medical gear and everybody just takes turns cycling through care. Um, I did two and a half months of EMT civilian side work and had to test to get my civilian certifications and then another two months of army certifications. So that was where the combat casualty care came in, which is what they're doing here. So I ultimately came out with my EMTB is what the civilian side translation of that certification is. So after that training, I was sent back to Washington State, which is where my unit was in Spokane, Washington. And I was part of the 396 Combat Support Hospital. Um, this picture kind of encompasses what I did at the hospital. I always joke that I was a medic, but I actually learned how to put, a, a put up tents is really what I did most of the time. Uh, so the combat support hospital is a mobile hospital. It used to be called a MASH, now it's called a CASH. Uh, and it's exactly like the TV show. Uh, <laughs> so it is a hospital created out of tents. All of these are connected. They have air conditioning and electricity. There are um, toilets in the back. There's fully equipped um, surgical tents. It's just like a hospital but all created out of tents. And we had to train to be able to build this in 12 hours. So we could do a hospital of this size from the ground in 12 hours and then take it down in 12. So I spent a lot of trainings. We would spend all day putting it up and then we'd come back the next day and take it all down to make sure that we were efficient. Um, so in the reserves, you are uh, called to duty as opposed to being on duty all the time. So a lot of people say it's one weekend a month, two weeks a year, but that's kind of different for medical personnel because we have different certifications that we have to keep up to date. So I would do two weeks of the annual training and then I would do two more weeks to recertify my EMT and then any health and safety missions that were left over. My cash unit um, was attached to countries like Guatemala, Germany, um, Costa Rica, and we would do health missions where we would go and give vaccines or make sure people's eyesights were up to date and we would do health missions, which was really unique with the reserves. So, uh, oops. Um, and then on top of that, if you had any promotional or leadership trainings you had to do, you would put in another couple weeks during the summer. So while I was in the reserves, I was in college, and then I would pretty much spend my whole summers, a couple months out of the year, doing all of these trainings. So it was kind of like a cool summer job. <laughs> um, this is a picture. That's me. Uh, and these are people who are in my platoon. And then that's our NCO. <laughs> Um, during my time in the cash, I did a few competitions, um, didn't win a lot of competitions, but I did them. And I had uh, competed in the best warrior competition, which is army wide. Um, and then I competed for my German proficiency badge. That badge is unique because um, it has a lot of track and field uh, kind of requirements. So we had to do shot put and the javelin and we did, uh, we swam in a pool. We had to do a timed 400 meter swim uh, with our full combat gear on. And so it, it was uh, all of the German requirements and I, completed everything really well until they handed me a handgun for the first time and said, okay, shoot this. And I was like, I don't know how to do that. Nobody's, I've only done an, like, so anyway, I uh, got right till the end until the handgun qualifications. And then I didn't quite get the badge, but it was super fun to compete because all of the events were German, doc uh, they were all the, uh, how do I say this? the German unit that we were associated with got to choose all the events that we competed in. So they were very fun and unique events that we got to do. Um, Army Best Medic competition is pretty self-explanatory. You just choose, you do your medical proficiency. And um, the APFT President's Award is a new uh, award to people who have PT scores over 300. So I competed in all of those. I didn't win any of them, but I was there. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and then these are people who are from my unit. We are doing the best warrior competition about to do a ruck march in this picture. This was my cash uh, hospital unit. And even though this is a panorama, you can't quite see how big hospital units are because we have a platoon here, 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 and it keeps going. So it, there, are, there were seven platoons in my unit, most of them officers because we had all of the doctors and physical therapists and all of that. So most of them were officers, which is really unique to the military where you have like split officers and enlisted. And it was a very huge unit. We probably had close to 400 people just in this unit. And then we had our sister unit, which also had about 400 people. So the whole hospital together was about 800 people. Um, so I did a summer mission in El Paso, Texas at Fort Bliss. Um, this is the hospital I worked in. Um, I can't remember the name of it. Williams, Bo Beaumont Williams. Yep, yeah, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so I worked in that hospital the year before it shut down. It, they're now building a new facility that is completely powered by solar and it's beautiful. And um, this was, this picture makes it look good. It was kind of decrepit when I worked there because it was about to shut down. Um, so yeah, I worked in pediatrics there for two weeks, and then I got to do some fun trainings on the obstacle course. They have an air assault course at Fort Bliss, so they let us go take a whirl at it. Um, again, maybe not something I was super great at, but I got to do it, so that was cool. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was kind of a training I did in El Paso. I got to do another, the next year I got to do a training in Vancouver, Washington, right outside of Portland, Oregon. Uh, this is where our sister unit was. Um, we did, uh, we got to play around with these tactical combat casualty mannequins, which you can see right here, that's a mannequin. These mannequins um, were fully interactive, so you would have an NCO hold a tablet and press buttons on what it wanted to display. And we had blood hooked up, and fake blood hooked up into these mannequins, so it had a pulse, and it would circulate blood, and you could press a button and say, I want it to bleed out of the abdomen, and it would start pulsing blood out of the abdomen. Uh, it, uh, you could attach amputated legs or de detach them, so you could have amputees. They are $4,000 mannequins each, um, but they are super cool. And you could do the tourniquets, and it'll show you exactly how successful you are, whether the blood keeps flowing or not. And you can punch in different diseases that you want them to have, and it'll start having increased heart. Oh, they breathe too, so it'll have increased breath. Uh, yeah, kind of creepy. This is why medics get a bad rap for being weirdos, but it's really cool. Um, they also do these things called blood labs, where they will have these bleeding mannequins set up. They will turn off all the lights in a room, and you have to navigate a dark room. They'll usually have fog machines. It's very theatric. Uh, and you have to navigate and make triage all your patients and do all of the stuff in the dark with just your little light. So they're really cool trainings that I got to do. Uh, this is a picture that I took at one of our field exercises. So you can't, I didn't take a picture of the hospital because I didn't think it looked interesting at the time and now I regret it, but. <laughs> um, so those are some of our uh, medical vehicles that we had. I got to do a summer in Launstuhl, Germany. Landstuhl has the largest U.S. military hospital outside of the United States. Um, I was there in 2015, and I, uh, this is a picture of the hospital, just so you can see the size of it. And this is a picture I took of the town. Um, I've heard all these crazy stories about Landstuhl because it is the triage center for people in the Middle East. It is the closest United States hospital, so they will helicopter people over to Landstuhl. And I had a lot of NCOs that trained me that told me all these crazy stories about their deployments to Landstuhl and all of the like hectic, the hospital is always overflowing, they keep building more branches. And when I got there, the uh, the war had kind of died down a little, so the I expected coming into this crazy uh, medical facility, and it was just 
dead. They had shut off the lights in certain departments. You walked by and half the hospital would be shut off. Um, they were only operating out of four wings. So it, it was just like this section right here was where I was working and the rest of the hospital was pretty much shut down. So that was kind of a crazy uh, experience for me thinking that I was gonna have all of these experiences. And really I worked in pediatrics again and was treating military wives and their sons so, or daughters, so their children. Um, but it was a really cool experience and um, I got to travel around Germany a lot. So we would work our uh, 12 hour shifts and then I would go get a train and come back to work the next day. And I didn't really sleep a lot while I was there, but <laughs> I just wanted to see as much as it, of it as I could. Um, so yeah, those are some pictures from Germany. Is that Heidelberg? Yeah, it is, <laughs> yep. It's like my favorite city there, so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Um, and then this picture was taken where the first corkscrew was invented for wine. Uh, <laughs> so then after four years in the cache, I transferred units to the 415th Infantry Drill Sergeant Unit. Um, I was a, the first female out of Washington, California, Montana, and Idaho. So this unit ranges all over the western half of the United States. And that was a unique experience for me coming from a hospital unit where they typically have higher numbers of women to going to be the only woman. Um, eventually more women joined that unit, but I was the first. And this is a picture of a cadet uh, doing some ruck march that I was overseeing. Um, they sent me to Salt Lake City, Utah. How a drill sergeant regiment works in the reserves is that you can opt in to do a cycle of basic training. So once you get your certifications, you can volunteer and go and leave for two and a half months to do a full cycle of basic training. And then you come back and live your normal life. That's kind of, and then if you choose not to do the full two and a half months because you have a job or whatever, your civilian side, um, you will go and provide coverage for people on maternity leave or who have injuries, drill sergeants who have injuries or maternity leave and you go in for two and a half weeks and provide that coverage and then you step back out. Um, I was sent to Salt Lake City, Utah to uh, do some promotional training. So I was there for a month. Uh, this is a picture of the barracks we lived out of. And then this is kind of our make-believe fob that we operated and trained out of. So who are you training? Um, so who I trained were people that were about to go to basic training, the National Guard and some um, recruiting stations have a program where if a person is go signs up to go do active duty service, they might have a week and a half of like um, time to fill before they catch their plane and leave. And so we would get these, um, we call them cadets, and we would scream at them and give them a taste of what basic training is going to be like. <laughs> uh, I think that it, for a lot of kids, it made them go, oh my God, I don't want to do this after all. I wish I'd never. But um, so those were the people I, were tra I was training and I got to do a lot of um, pre-basic training. I uh, was not able to go to drill sergeant school because of all of the uh, government cutbacks that happened in 2016 2017 so because of all the shutdowns they couldn't afford to send me um, they didn't send anybody from our unit to drill sergeant school for two years and then they finally had enough money to send people but my contract had ended so um, I got to be a drill specialist and kind of that E4, uh, I got to scream at people and had the respect, but I was not technically a drill sergeant. So um, that was kind of my role there and I also provided medical coverage. So this is my mom and I after I finished that training in Salt Lake City. <coughs> Um, another training I got to do was in Helena, Montana, where we got to yell at cadets um, for a couple weeks. <laughs> uh, this was a Black Hawk that we got to fly in, and it was kind of a cool, uh, we got to jump out of the Black Hawk and immediately start yelling at people with the knife hand, and all of the cadets were scared shitless. So. <laughs> uh, 
so yeah, th that's a cool aerial view of Helena, Montana and the facility that we got to um, be at there. Um, my whole family's army. I've got my mom again, who did her 24 years of service. Uh, this is my stepdad. He requested that I just say that he was a senior enlisted grunt. So, <laughs> uh, and then this is my brother. He had commissioned that day and his twin who had uh, enlisted a couple years ago. So they're a year younger than me. So we kind of have that little army family going. My mom is very proud. Um, and then here's more pictures of my brothers. They ran into each other. They're both at um, Joint Base Lewis McCord in Seattle. Uh, so they ran into each other while training randomly and got a picture. And then this is, doesn't he look like a typical officer? I don't know. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I was in the reserves from 2012 to 2018. I never deployed. I just did those um, few month long trainings during the summer. Uh, and now I'm out and I accepted a job working with veterans in Colorado and I'm new to Colorado. So now I, uh, Kind of my passion for my family and all of our veteran service uh, has now transferred into my civilian life. So I work with veterans navigating the healthcare system. Uh, so yeah, does anyone have any questions? What do you work for? I work for mental health partners under a government grant. Yeah. So yeah. I never got to go to Costa Rica, but people in my unit did. And when they were in Costa Rica, they were working at a partner reservist unit, um, doing medical care to local civilians. Oh. Yeah. So when you broke down your cash units, do they have, they just use um, flatbed trucks mm -hmm. to transport the stuff? Yep, that's exactly what it and, looks like. In Salt Lake, where were you stationed? I can't remember the name of that. I was at Camp Williams, kind of right outside of Salt Lake City. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, it's over by Provo. Okay. Yeah. It's over by the depot? Mm hmm. Okay. Yeah. Did you do your 20 in the reserves? Are you going to stay in the reserves? No, I got out. Uh, I, it just wasn't something I wanted to do for the rest of my I really enjoyed my time and it paid for my education. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I decided to get out. And they offered me a pretty substantial bonus and I didn't take it, maybe regret it, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so I have another question. Yeah. My, uh, sure. My daughter's 25, she's mm -hmm. in school. Would you recommend this path for somebody wanting to be a nurse? So, um, this, my brother is actually in optometry school and that's what he's doing with the military is they're completely paid for his undergraduate degree and if he chose to do active duty service, he, they would pay for his optometry school as well, which is exactly what they would do if, uh, with your daughter is if she chose to do active duty time, they would reimburse her for her nursing school. I think it just depends on the person, on whether you're willing to do active duty or not. Um, I think the reservist was a really good fit for me because it was a minimal commitment, but I still got my education, and I came out of it with civilian credentials. So, so. active duty would put her possibly in the Middle East? In a possibly, yep, possibly. And even the reservists, I always had, we were up for deployment a couple times, it just never came to fruition. So even in the reservists or National Guard, you have that risk. So are you an RN? Nope, my mom was, but I just have my EMTB. So yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. that's yeah, that's what my civilian, I also have like a phlebotomist cer uh, certificate, so I could do that as well. Um, I, yeah, I kind of left the medical field and now that's kind of what I'm doing in the civilian side. It kind of, I have a degree in sociology, so it, this is kind of emergency medicine meets sociology is what I'm doing right now with helping people navigate the healthcare system. So that's kind of, I've been enjoying, I, it's a new position for me and I've been really enjoying it, but that's kind of the intersection there where I knew I didn't want to do emergency medicine anymore, but I still wanted to remain in the medical field.
could you explain a little bit more about what you're doing? Because you're in what, in Boulder? Helping yeah, I'm people? actually in Broomfield. I work in Broomfield. Um, Jim Hutchinson? Yeah, I do work with him, yeah. yeah. So uh, I work with Tim. I uh, help people get in for services and eliminate any barriers to services. So if you're like, I can't even think about health care because I don't have clothing or I don't have food or I need child care, I can help people with that. And then with the eventual goal of getting you set up with a primary care physician, navigate the VA. If you don't want to be in the VA, I can help you navigate resources outside of the VA. So I'm just kind of in a position where I help veterans figure out what's best suited for them as far as their health care needs go. How do they, do they contact you or does Tim yeah, tell you Tim to has, talk to them or how does it work? Sure, Tim and I refer people to each other. Uh, so he has my information, I have his. Uh, and then people can find me or contact me through the website that we have uh, at Mental Health Partners. So. Uh, yeah, that's exactly how it works is people email me or call me and then I meet up with them to make sure that their needs are met. And well, just as an example, maybe yeah. explain. I know an elderly Korean War veteran mm -hmm. who lives kind of with his son or so. Son's trying to help the veteran and I'm not certain things are working out too well. Mm. Is that something you can help? Totally. Yep. I have resources for that. The only thing is that it has to be in Broomfield or Boulder oh, County. Yeah, no, they're in Broomfield. Yeah. So those are definitely <laughs> things that that's what I do on the daily is just help people who don't know where to turn. And people uh, who like don't even know how to apply for Medicaid or insurance, I kind of walk them through that too. So, Ooh. yeah. <laughs> that is quite an excellent resource. <laughs> the mind for any you know elderly veteran you know in the community who's trying to struggle with things and particularly getting resources to help them at home or whatever do you uh, make house calls I, I don't make house calls yeah. but i do make public calls so i am allowed to meet people at coffee shops and stuff like that i just can't go to people's houses <laughs> yeah okay so if we wanted to contact you to try and arrange something do we go through tim you can definitely go through Tim. Okay. Uh, I, I have a card if anyone oh, wants yeah. one. <laughs> sure, yeah. <laughs> I can pass some of those out. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, what was the most challenging thing? You know, in your career. So the most thing. challenging thing for me was working in the drill sergeant unit being the only female. Uh, there were things like I wasn't allowed to drive any of the vehicles because they said I was a bad driver because I was a woman. So uh, things like that were, it made me real feisty. So, But it probably made me a better person because now I'm much more aggressive. With, <laughs> so, but yeah, that was probably the hardest thing was working in, the, working in a position where I didn't have any other female NCOs to go to when I wanted advice or stuff like that. That was probably the most challenging thing I had. So yeah. they actually yelled at were they male and female? Yes, they were. Intimidated? Oh, yes, awesome. I did. Yes, I did. <laughs> Was that your favorite part? Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Health care, schmealth care. I just liked yelling, so. <laughs> well, any other questions? Well, Elena, thank you so thank much. You. Thank 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 you. Great. So please uh, stick around, talk with Elena some more. Yeah. We have more coffee and donut holes. Are you a hiker? I love through. hiking. Yes. yes. Uh, I, I uh, did a little online search on your name, and I came across uh, all trails and a number of trails that you... Uh, <laughs> you saw my reviews. <laughs> yeah. Great. Of, of <laughs> a lot of the trails in this area, uh -huh. up in the foothills outside Boulder. Yep. You have can, you, you've hiked all those? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you can pretty much find me in the mountains any free time I have, so... <laughs> How long have you been in Colorado? I've been here for maybe oh, just about a year, maybe less than a year. Yeah. Okay. There's yep. a lot to explore here. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you again. Yeah. That was a marvelous talk. Thank you.